So let's go into this next one. The legend Jose Aldo, King of Rio, takes on Marab Davalishvili, the machine. Now, this was a fight that we knew could go two extremes. Marab would do what he did, or Aldo can catch him with one of the knees or one of those big punches and get a finish. That's just like the extreme difference in styles, right? Now, Marab, what he does to people in the room, what he does to people in the fights, he is a tornado. He is the machine for a reason. The guy has a gas tank like no other. Now, the first round, there was some ah moments from Aldo looking like he might have clipped Marab, but honestly, I think it's more of the crowd than actually connection. So I think Marab in that in that fight, in my opinion, for a flawless strategical fight, Aldo sitting on the cage yawning and playing to the crowd doesn't do anything for you. You have to get off the cage. You have to make the attempt to show like you can defend and you can get out of there and keep the fights in the position where you want it. You know where we want the fight. We're either looking to take you down or we're looking to stifle the action and beat you up against the cage. That's what Marab did. So for anyone, I, I was just kind of blown away that Jose Aldo actually thought he won that fight. You could try to make the argument, even though I still thought Marab won the first round, you could try to make the argument that, okay, maybe, maybe uh, he won the first round because of the crowd getting the, making the big pops and getting involved. Um, but in my opinion, I, I just felt like um, it, Aldo didn't do enough in the first round. And he damn sure didn't do enough in the second or the third. So for me, that was an easy 30-27. But again, I said you could make the argument, but I don't think that he won the first round. I still thought Marab did more than he did. And Marab got a takedown in the third round. Again, if your hands touch the mat, it is a takedown. If one hand touched the mat, it is a takedown. Marab took down the legend. He wasn't forcing the action trying to get myself tired and if you did see I forget which clinch moment it was when Marab went for the takedown and then he broke Aldo then tried to I think it was the first round he surged forward and tried to do like the jumping knee and try to throw something at Marab when he was going to catch him towards the end at the like we call this thing like a trap or we call it we call it closing the door so if you throw a combination and your opponent backs up past, past that black line that's like closing the door we're going to give you a couple of options because you can only go left or right. You can't go backwards anymore. So we close the door and we look to give you a hard exit, meaning you got to eat a big shot in order to get out of there. And that's what Jose Aldo tried to do to Marab. Marab defended perfectly. Um, didn't take any real damage from that jumping knee or whatever you want to call it, that attempt from Jose Aldo. It just looked exciting, looked flashy, um, looked like a moment in the fight. And uh, that was really it. I think he thought that Marab was going to be tired coming out of that clinch. But smartly, one of the things that we drill, we always go through our MMA wrestling class and we always discuss when to squeeze, when to relax and let the body weight do the work. Not to exhaust your arms. Let the opponent think that you're going to get tired. Let them work and try to pull with the overhook, the underhook. Let them carry all your weight, be dead weight on them and... Let them exhaust themselves, and then when you feel the moment, the opportunity, you escape out of there, or they escape out of there, I should say. Now, their arms are going to be heavy, and then you attack them again, and then you go again for the takedown. Um, but Aldo tried to press Marab, thinking that maybe Marab was tired, but I think Marab fought perfectly, man. He did such a good job of neutralizing the position. He landed like, I want to say like 30 knees at one point, I think in that second or third round, and I'm just like, there's no way Aldo can win this fight unless he gets a knockdown. Like a real legitimate knockdown to go, oh, okay, he did more damage in that round. And Marab did a great job neutralizing him. I think halfway through the second round, you see Jose Aldo out of the clinch. He takes like a big deep breath and he starts walking backwards. And you see his boulders just like, just kind of like throttling through like molasses. Like it's just like, mm, mm. like you could tell the energy was dipping and I start going, He's tired. This is the time to get him. Marab starts to open up a little bit more with the hands and still threatening with the takedown to keep him honest to make him know that it's still not a striking fight. We are still doing MMA. I'm going to keep the pressure on you. And if I get a takedown and punch you out, I'm going to do that. Aldo's goal was to not get taken down 
okay, he did that for the most part. He got taken down one time, the third round, hands on the mat, kind of chilled out in that position. But it's not enough to win the fight, you know? Marab, I thought, like I said, dominated the fight, dominated the action. He clearly won. You can say whatever you want, but it was a dangerous opponent, a dangerous opponent, uh, a threat of a being knocked out or dropped or being hurt really, really bad was there the entire time because that's just Aldo's M.O. He just one of those heavy hitters. He cracks, and uh, to deal with Marab, you know that that pressure is going to be there the entire time. So that is the difference. I keep telling these guys, good luck trying to find a guy who can emulate Marab. Good luck trying to find a guy who has an endless gas tank as Marab. The closest thing you're going to ever find to that is maybe tr finding these tough grapplers who can give you rounds like that and swapping them out every single round. Outside of that, good luck. Um, again, people keep asking, what, we're, what are we going to do? I still got to win. If I lose my fight to TJ Dillashaw, the door's wide open for Marab to do whatever the hell he wants to do. The UFC matchmaker say, you know what, we're going to throw Marab in there against Cheeto Vera um, or against the winner of TJ. I think if if Cheeto, if I were to lose, hypothetically, knock on wood, then I think they throw Cheeto in against um, TJ Dillashaw, I think because they're going to want the most exciting matchup. But then you have Marab who takes out another top contender. Now what do you do? You have to put him in there. You know, so it's all about the timetables and whether or not Cheeto's going to want to wait. If Volkanovski isn't going to fight Henry Cejudo, then maybe Henry fights Cheeto or Henry fights Marab. There's options for everybody. And there's options for me as well. And then you still have Jan, you still have O'Malley, you still have Adrian Giannis, you still have Ricky Simone. There's still a lot of big players in this weight class. So this, this weight class right now is insane. There's plenty of options. Again, I have to do my job in Abu Dhabi, October 22nd, and I fully plan on doing that. And again, this is a good problem for us to have. That means two guys in one gym, top tier level, iron sharpens iron, both of us pushing our game to the next level. It's a good problem to have. How can it be bad? So uh, we already said we aren't going to fight each other, especially fighting each other for... <laughs> You know, some people will say, like, I'll take that all day long. But it's not even that. It's just like, why would we ever fight each other for money that can be burnt in literally a year's time? And that's not even spending it recklessly. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have a crazy lifestyle. I don't go spending thousands of dollars on tables and bottles and, and buying private jet flights and things. Like, I don't do that. I have three houses. I'm smart with my money. I have insurances. I have... And when I say insurances, I'm, I'm talking SEPT IRAs. You know, so I, I'm doing the right thing. I have a healthy bank account. I've helped my family. I like to think I'm pretty intelligent, you know? But if I'm going to ever do something like that, the juice, ain't, the juice is nowhere near worth the squeeze. For me to ruin a, a, a brotherhood like that, for what? For money that I'm going to need, like, in the next year, or if I have a kid, I don't have health insurance, you know? So it was like, what are we talking about? Like, why would I ever do some, such a thing? So that's my mentality. That's where I'm at. And um, it is what it is. Uh, super proud, super happy for Marab. And uh, for him to get a huge feather in his cap like that, that's a lot for MMA in Georgia. To me, he's already a champion. He beat a world champion. How can you not be considered a world champion? And then just beat him. He dominated. He literally, this guy had no answer for him whatsoever. So the question is, what are you guys in the Bantamweight division going to do? You got two Bulldogs at the top of the division, and we're taking on all comers. Back to back, like the Double Dragons, baby. <laughs> so, like I said, we'll see what happens with my fight with TJ. Uh, let me send this guy the proper way, and uh, hopefully... There is a window of opportunity for me to go up to 45 or we can explore Marab at 25. Um, you know, I, the, my only thing about him going down to 25 is obviously those 25ers are a lot faster. And then obviously at 25, it's a bigger cut. It would be like me making Marab going down to 25 would be me fighting at 45. At, but for him at 35, because he only walks around about 55, 58 on a heavy day. And that's him like really just eating a lot. Me, I'm touching 170 and higher. 
you know, so I have to like this morning I woke up 159.4, super happy. I was like, okay, my, my weights and my metabolism is getting under control. I'm doing the right things. I'm slowly slimming down. Um, you know, so then it gets easier. Like for me, if I want to do 45, I would have to actually probably little, probably lift a little bit more. I, I, and I wouldn't want to get bulky. I want I would want to keep my speed advantage, but I would need to make sure I can explode and get those takedowns on those bigger guys with those taller frames and make sure I could do it the right way. And I would be a lot happier not having to suck all the way down to 135 skin and bones where I'm just a straight up, what would you call a string bean? So we'll see. There's options and uh, we'll evaluate everything. But again, we both need to be in a position first. Rob did his job. Now it's time for me to do my job. We got a couple big fights. August 26th, we got Big Black, a.k.a. Um, Ed, Edwin Smart, my brother Kelvin Sterling. August 26th, I think for Cage Fury. Go check those guys out next week. They're fighting, I think it's either PA or New Jersey. That's where most of the fights are for CFFC. Then we have September 9th, we have our guy uh, Steve Lee. We have Anthony Dilemme, um, a.k.a. The, the Dilemma. <laughs> we have... A bunch of guys coming up, so stay tuned. We have a lot of um, promising prospects, I think, coming out of Long Island. And uh, then we're going to parlay that into October 22nd. I'm sure guys are going to fight in between that time frame as well. Austin Halleck, a lot of these guys. So, as always, thank you guys for always tuning in. If you like my shit, subscribe to my shit. We're spinning backfish, baby. I'll see you guys later. I'm about to get the day started. Peace.